Paradise Found by William Warren, The Cradle of the Human Race at the North Pole. Diagram illustrating the true key to ancient cosmology and mythical geography. Compare page 479, the northern celestial pole in the zenith. AB, the axis of the heavens in perpendicular position. The axis of the earth in perpendicular position. The abode of the supreme god or gods. Europe, Asia, and the known portion of Africa. The earth surrounding the equatorial ocean river. And the abode of disembodied human souls. The abode of demons. The location of submerged Eden. The strength of the hill of Sion. This book is not the work of a dreamer. It is a thoroughly serious and sincere attempt to present what is, to the author's mind, the true and final solution of one of the greatest and most fascinating of all problems connected with the history of mankind. That this true solution has not been furnished before is not strange. The suggestion that primitive Eden was at the Arctic Pole seems at first sight the most incredible of all wild and willful paradoxes and it is only within the lifetime of our own generation that the progress of geological discovery has relieved the hypothesis of fatal an antecedent improbability. Moreover, when one considers the enormous variety and breadth of the fields from which its evidences of truth must be derived, when one remembers how recent are those comparative sciences on whose results the argument must chiefly depend, when one observes that many of the most striking of our alleged proofs both in the physical and in the anthropological domain, are precisely the latest of the conclusions of these most modern of all sciences, it is easy to see that a generation ago the demonstration here attempted could not have been given. Even five years ago, some of the most interesting and cogent of our arguments would as a yet have been lacking. The interest which has so long invested our problem, and which has prompted so many attempts to solve it, was never greater than today. The lapse of centuries has rendered many other questions antiquated, but not this. On the contrary, the more the modern world has advanced in new knowledge, the more exigent has grown the necessity of finding a valid solution. Men are feeling as never before that until the starting point of human history can be determined, the historian, the archaeologist, and the paleontological anthropologist are all working in the dark. It is seen that without this desideratum, the ethnologist, the philologist, the mythographer, the theologian, the sociologist, can none of them construct anything not liable to profound modification, if not to utter overthrow, the moment any new light shall be thrown upon the mother region and the prehistoric movement of the human race. Every anthropological science, therefore, and every science related to anthropology, seems at the present moment to be standing in a state of dubitant expectancy, willing to work little tentatively but conscious of its destitution of the needful primal datum and conscious of its consequential lack of a valid structural law. To the believer in revelation, or even in the most ancient and venerable ethnic traditions, the volume here presented will be found to possess uncommon interest. For many years the public mind has been schooled in a narrow naturalism, which has in its worldview as little room for the extraordinary as it has for the supernatural. Decade after decade, the representatives of this teaching have been measuring the natural phenomena of every age and of every place by the petty measuring rod of their own local and temporary experience. So long and so successfully have they dogmatized on the constancy of nature's laws and the uniformity of nature's forces, that of late it has required no small degree of courage to enable an intelligent man to stand up in the face of his generation and avow his personal faith in the early existence of men of gigantic stature and of almost millenarian longevity. Especially have clergymen and Christian teachers and writers upon biblical history been embarrassed by the popular incredulity on these subjects, and not infrequently by a consciousness that this incredulity was in some measure shared by themselves. To all such, and indeed to all the broader-minded among the naturalists themselves, a new philosophy of primeval history, a philosophy which for the alleged extraordinary effects provides the adequate extraordinary causes, cannot fail to prove most welcome. The execution of the plan of the book is by no means all that the author could desire. To the elaboration of so vast an argument, 
the materials for which must be gleaned from every possible field of knowledge, the broadest and profoundest scholar might well devote the undistracted labor of a lifetime. To the writer loaded with the cares of a laborious executive office, there were lacking both the leisure and the equipment otherwise attainable for so high a task. The best he could do was to turn one or two summer vacations into work time and give the result to the world. Of the correctness of his position he has no doubt, and of the preparedness of the scientific world to accept it he is also confident. To the foregoing remarks it may be proper to add that apart from its immediate purpose, the book has interest, and it is hoped value, as a contribution to the infant science of comparative mythology. By the application of the author's true key to an ancient cosmology and mythical geography, it has been possible to adjust and interpret a great variety of ancient cosmological and geographical notions never before understood by modern scholars. For example, the origin and significance of the Chinbat Bridge are here for the first time explained. The indication of the polocentric character common to the mythical systems of sacred geography among all ancient peoples will probably be new to every reader. The new light thrown upon such questions as those relating to the direction of the sacred quarter, the location of the abode of the dead, the character and position of the cosmical tree, the course of the backward flowing ocean river, the correlation of the navels of earth and heaven, not to enumerate other points, can hardly fail to attract the lively attention of all students and teachers of ancient mythology and mythical geography. To teachers of Homer, the fresh contributions toward a right understanding of Homeric cosmology are sure to prove of value, and if in the end, the work may only lead to a systematic and intelligent teaching of the long-neglected but most important science of ancient cosmology and mythical geography in all reputable universities and classical schools, it will surely not have been written in vain. That the author has escaped all errors and oversights while ranging through so numerous and such diverse fields of investigation, many of which are but just open to the pioneering specialist, is too much to expect. He only asks that any such blemishes which a more competent scholarship may detect, or which the progress of new learning may yet bring to light, may not be allowed to prejudice the force of true arguments, but may be pointed out in the spirit of a candid and helpful criticism. In conclusion, the author respectfully commits his work for all truth-seeking spirits, not less to the patient investigators of nature than to the student of history, of literature, and of religion. Particularly would he commend it to all those yearning and waiting Konigsonen, whose experience has been described by Hans Andersen in the words, Once upon a time there was a king, a son, nobody had so many and such beautiful books as he. In these all that had ever happened in the world he could read and see depicted in splendid engravings. Of every people and of every land could he get information, but as to where the Garden of Eden was, not a word was to be found therein. Just this it was, on which he meditated most of all. Paradise Found by William Warren. And we're just going to go through some of the illustrations first of all, so that we can see the parallels to Flat Earth. And it's, it's kind of important just to look at this first. So, the night skies of Eden. What we'll notice is that um, that he was incorrect about the rotundity of the Earth. He believed that the Earth is round. But everything else, all the other information that he adds up in this, is perfectly in tune with flat Earth cosmology. And actually, is it's, it's amazing that he missed it. It's almost as though he put this together to throw people off of the flat Earth. Because all the information in it, even when it points to flat Earth, they try to twist it as though it doesn't uh, indicate a flat Earth. And we've all seen the Egyptian um, cosmology pictures, and you'll see that he tries to say that the Egyptians say that the Earth was round. So, just kind of funny. So that was the antipodal polar mountains. This is a great chapter. We're going to get to this shortly. Part four, the fourth part, part fourth. The Hypothesis Confirmed by Ethnic Traditions. Chapter 1, The Ancient Cosmology and Mythical Geography. The Cradle of the Race in the Japanese, Chinese, Aryan, Hindu, Iranian, Persian, Akkadian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Ancient Egyptian, and Ancient Greek. And as I was saying, those are all perfect Flat Earth cosmologies. 
there's no doubt about it. We'll go through each one, including the Greeks. Yeah, Homer. That Homer uh, talks about the firmament and Hades and heavens and angels and Zeus and all of that. The heavenly chariots, the earth of the Hindus, Bharata, Kimparusha, Haravarska, the earth of the Hindus. And we've seen that before in other, we have the uh, CGI of that. And then again, so this would be Mount Meru in the center, sticking up. The Hindus number two. Well, I guess that was that as well. Okay. The Earth of the Persians. And again, see that was the flat Earth from above. So we'll look at it again. The North Pole. Amazing. This is the Persians. So there is Sumeru again which ascends to the heavens. We're looking straight down at it. That's the center of the flat earth map. The North Pole ascends to the heavens there. The navel of the earth. There it is, the North Pole. And they, this one leaves out, of course, the detail that we have in our other maps there from Mercator. The Earth of Columbus. Yeah, now this is what the other one was that I tried to show you. Um, the antipodal polar. I'll go back to that. This one. So I'll read a bit of this. In this cosmological conception, the upright axis of the world is poetically conceived of as a majestic pillar supporting the heavens and furnishing the pivot on which they revolve. Euripides and Aristotle unmistakably identified the pillar of Atlas with this world axis. How interesting a feature this pillar became in ancient mythologies will be seen below in chapter third of this part, in chapter second of part six and elsewhere in this volume. Again, according to this view, the highest part of the earth, its true summit, would of course be at the North Pole, and since the whole upper or northern hemisphere would in this case be conceived of as rising on all sides from the equatorial ocean toward that summit, nothing would be more natural than to view the entire upper half of the earth as itself a vast mountain. So they feel there's a giant mountain on the top and a giant mountain on the bottom. Extremely easy for the imagination to carry the summit of so stupendous a mountain into and far above the clouds, and even to extend it to such a height that the gods of heaven might be conceived of have, as having their abode upon its top. This is precisely what came to pass, and hence in the cosmology of the ancient Egyptians, Akkadians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Indians, Chinese, and others we find under various names, but always easily recognizable, this mountain of the world, this Weltberg, situated at the north pole of the earth, supporting or otherwise connecting with the city of the gods, and serving as the axis around which sun, moon, and stars revolve. Often we also find evidence that the under hemisphere was in like manner conceived of as an inverted mountain, antipodal to the mountain of the gods, and connecting at its apex with the abode of demons. So at the top it's the mount of gods, and on the lower it's the mount of the demons. But what we see there, what they're really showing on all their maps that he's misidentifying, is that it's actually the flat earth and that there's a mountain in the center and that underneath of that mountain and underneath of the flat earth is where hell is the world of homer mount olympus tartarus so you keep showing it as a globe but I'll show you the flat earth, the real way that they actually interpreted it, that's actually better. And it's basically that there's the mountain on the top and on the, the bottom, it's an inversion of a mountain, it's not an upside down mountain. An inverted mountain is a set of stairs descending. Like that. So the flat earth is here and at the North Pole here or wherever you wanna put it, but that's the antipodal version of Mount Meru that descends down in the, at the center.
Part first, location of Eden, state of the question. Results of the explorers, historic and legendary. Results of the theologians. Results of non-theological scholars, naturalists, ethnologists, archeologists. You shall understand that no mortal man may approach to that paradise. For by a land, no man may go. For wild beasts that are in the deserts, and for the high mountains and great huge rocks that no man may pass by, for the dark places are there. And by the rivers may no man go. For the water runs so roughly and so sharply, because it comes down so outrageously from the high places above, that it runs in so great waves that no ship may row or sail against it. And the water roars so, and makes so huge a noise and so great a tempest, though no man may hear another in the ship, though he cried with all the might he could. Many great lords have essayed with great will many times to pass by those rivers towards paradise, with full great companies, but they might not speed in their voyage, and many died for weariness of rowing against the strong waves, and many of them became blind, and many deaf from the noise of the water, and some perished and were lost in the waves, so that no mortal man may approach to that place without the special grace of God. Sir John de Mondeville Chapter 1 The Results of Explorers, Historic and Legendary Men learnt die Welt am besten durch Riesen kennen. Uh, it basically translates to Man learns best when he travels. K. H. W. Volker One of the most interesting and pathetic passages to be found in all literature is that in which Christopher Columbus announces to his royal patrons his supposed discovery of the ascent to the gate of the long-lost Garden of Eden. With what emotions must his heart have thrilled as, steering up this ascent, he felt his ship smoothly rising toward the sky, the weather becoming milder as he rose, to be so near the paradise of God's own planting, to be the first discoverer of the way in which the believing world could at length, after so many ages, once more approach its sacred precincts, even if forbidden to enter. What an exquisite experience it must have been to the lonely spirit of that great explorer. It is his third voyage. He is in the Gulf of Pariah, to the north or northwest of the mouth of the Orinoco. In his loyal epistle to Ferdinand and Isabella, thus he writes, The Holy Scriptures record that our Lord made the earthly paradise, and planted in it the tree of life, and thence springs a fountain from which the four principal rivers of the world take their source, namely the Ganges in India, the Tigris and Euphrates, and the Nile. I do not find, nor ever have found, any account by the Romans or Greeks which fixes in a positive manner the site of the terrestrial paradise. Neither have I seen it given in any map mond laid down from authentic sources. Some place it in Ethiopia at the sources of the Nile, but others traversing all these countries found neither the temperature nor the altitude of the sun correspond with their ideas respecting it, nor did it appear that the overwhelming waters of the deluge had been there. Some pagans pretended to adduce arguments to establish that it was in the fortunate islands, now called the Canaries. St. Isidore, Bede, and Strabo, and the master of scholastic history, with St. Ambrose and Scotus, and all the learned theologians, agree that the earthly paradise is in the east. I have already described my ideas concerning this hemisphere and its form, and I have no doubt that if I could pass below the equinoctial line, after reaching the highest point of which I have spoken, I should find a much milder temperature and a variation in the stars and in the water. Not that I suppose that elevated point to be navigable, nor even that there is water there. Indeed, I believe it is impossible to ascend thither, because I am convinced that it is the spot of the earthly paradise, whither no one can go but by God's permission. But this land which your highness have now sent me to explore is very extensive, and I think there are many other countries in the south, of which the world has never had any knowledge. I do not suppose that the earthly paradise is in the form of a rugged mountain, as the descriptions of it have made it appear, but that it is on the summit of the spot which I have described as being in the form of the stalk or stem end of a pear. The approach to it from a distance must be by a constant and gradual ascent, but I believe that, as I have already said, no one could ever reach the top. I think also that the water I have described may proceed from it, though it be far off, and that stopping at the place I have just left, it forms this lake. There are great indications of this being the terrestrial paradise, for its situation coincides with the opinions of the holy and wise theologians whom I have mentioned, and, moreover, the other evidences agree with the supposition. For I have never either read or heard of fresh water coming in so large a quantity in close conjunction with the water of the sea. The idea is also corroborated by the blandness of the temperature, and if the water of which I speak does not proceed from the earthly paradise, 
it seems to be a still greater wonder. For I do not believe that there is any river in the world so large and deep. When I left the dragon's mouth, which is the northernmost of the two straits which I have described, and which I so named on the day of Our Lady of August the first, I found that the sea ran so strongly to the westward that between the hour of mass, when I weighed anchor, and the hour of complines, I made sixty-five leagues of four miles each, and not only was the wind not violent, but on the contrary very gentle, which confirmed me in the conclusion that in sailing southward there is a continuous ascent, while there is a corresponding descent towards the north. I hold it for certain that the waters of the sea move from east to west with the sky, and that in passing this track they hold to a more rapid course, and have thus eaten away large tracts of land, and hence has resulted this great number of islands. Indeed, these islands themselves afford an additional proof of it, for on the one hand all those which lie west and east, or a little more obliquely northwest and southeast, are broad, while those which lie north and south, or northeast and southwest, that is, in a directly contrary direction to the said winds, are narrow. Furthermore, that these islands should possess the most costly productions is to be accounted for by the mild temperature, which comes to them from heaven, since these are the most elevated parts of the world. It is true that in some parts the waters do not appear to take this course, but this only occurs in certain spots where they are obstructed by land, and hence they appear to take different directions. I now return to my subject of the land of Gracia, and of the river and lake found there, which latter might more properly be called a sea, for a lake is but a small expanse of water which, when it becomes great, deserves the name of a sea, just as we speak of the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. And I think that if the river mentioned does not proceed from the terrestrial paradise, it comes from an immense tract of land situated in the south, of which hitherto no knowledge has been obtained. But the more I reason on the subject, the more satisfied I become that the terrestrial paradise is situated in the spot I have described, and I ground my opinion upon the arguments and authorities already quoted. May it please the Lord to grant your highness a long life, and health and peace, to follow out so noble an investigation, in which I think our Lord will receive great service. Spain, considerable increase of its greatness, and all Christians much consolation and pleasure, because by this means the name of our Lord will be published abroad. Alas, for the hope of settling the problem of Eden's sight by actual exploration. Columbus never lived to find his paradise, and geographers have long ago ascertained that the golden summit of the world is not in Venezuela, nor in any of its neighbor states. Of course, Columbus supposed himself to be off the eastern coast, not of a new continent, but of Asia. His idea of the location of the terrestrial paradise as in, or to the eastward of, farther India, was the prevailing idea of his age. The Hereford map of the world, dating from the 13th century, represents the favored spot as a circular island to the east of India, and as separated from the mainland not only by the sea but also by a battlemented wall, with its one gate to the west through which our first parents were supposed to have been expelled. Hugo de St. Victor wrote, Paradise is a spot in the Orient productive of all kinds of wood and pomiferous trees. It contains the tree of life. There is neither cold nor heat there, but perpetually an equable temperature. It contains a fountain which flows forth in four rivers. So Gautier de Metz, in a poem written in the 13th century, describes the terrestrial paradise as situated in an unapproachable region in Asia, surrounded by flames, and guarded at its only gate by an armed angel. In the year 1322, Sir John de Mondeville made his memorable pilgrimage to the east. In his account of these travels, after describing the marvelous kingdom of Prester John in India, he says, And beyond the land and isles and deserts of Prester John's lordship, and going straight towards the east, men find nothing but mountains and great rocks, and there is the dark region where no man may see, neither by day nor by night, as they of the country say. And that desert and that place of darkness lasts from this coast unto terrestrial paradise, where Adam, our first father, and Eve were put who dwelt there but a little while, and that is towards the east, at the beginning of the earth. Of paradise I cannot speak properly, for I was not there. It is far beyond, and I repent not going there, but I was not worthy. But as I have heard say of wise men beyond, I shall tell you with good will, terrestrial paradise, as wise men say, is the highest place of the earth, and it is so high that it nearly touches the circle of the moon there, as the moon makes her turn. For it is so high that the flood of Noah might not come to it, that would have covered all the earth of the world all about and above and beneath except paradise. And this paradise is enclosed all about with a wall, and men know not whereof it is, for the wall is covered all over with moss as it seems. 
and it seems not that the wall is natural stone, and that wall stretches from the south to the north, and it has but one entry which is closed with burning fire, so that no man that is mortal dare enter. And in the highest place of paradise, exactly in the middle, is a well that casts out four streams which run by diverse lands, of which the first is called Pison or Ganges that runs through India or Amlak, in which river are many precious stones and much lignum, aloes and much sand of gold. And the other river is called Nile or Gison, which goes through Ethiopia, and after through Egypt. And the other is called Tigris, which runs by Assyria and by Armenia the Great. And the other is called Euphrates, which runs through Media, Armenia, and Persia. And men there beyond say that all the sweet waters of the world, above and beneath, take their beginning from the well of paradise, and out of that well all waters come and go. Various writers and mapmakers of the same age seem very evidently to have identified the paradise of Genesis with the island of Ceylon. Even to this day, a mount near the center of the island bears the name of Adam's Peak. According to a Mohammedan tradition, this was only so called because it was the place where Adam alighted when cast out of the true celestial paradise in heaven. Nevertheless, Christian tradition or legend long lingered about Ceylon as the genuine site of primitive Eden. In entire accord with this view is the remarkable story of Prince Irek, as told in an Icelandic saga of the 14th century. Mr. Bering Gould, in a style not very reverent, has summarized the tale as follows. Irek was a son of Thrand, king of Drontheim, and having taken upon him a vow to explore the deathless land, he went to Denmark, where he picked up a friend of the same name as himself. They then went to Constantinople and called upon the emperor, who held a long conversation with them, which is duly reported, relative to the truths of Christianity and the sight of the deathless land, which, he assures them, is nothing more nor less than paradise. The world, said the monarch, who had not forgotten his geography since he left school, is precisely 180,000 stages round, about a million English miles, and it is not propped up on posts, not a bit. It is supported by the power of God, and the distance between earth and heaven is 100,045 miles. Another MS reads 9,382 miles. The difference is immaterial, so they must have meant 10,000 there, although it says 100,000. And round about the earth is a big sea called Ocean. And what's to the south of the earth? asked Eric. Oh, there is the end of the world, and that is India. And pray, where am I to find the deathless land? That lies, uh, paradise, I suppose you mean? Uh, well, it lies east of India. Having obtained this information, the two Irex started, furnished with letters from the Greek emperor. They traversed Syria and took ship, probably at Balsora, then, reaching India, they proceeded on their journey on horseback, till they came to a dense forest, the gloom of which was so great through the interlacing of the bows, that even by day the stars could be observed twinkling, as though they were seen from the bottom of a well. On emerging from the forest, the two Irex came upon a strait, separating them from a beautiful land which was unmistakably paradise. And the Danish Irek, intent on displaying his scriptural knowledge, pronounced the strait to be the river Pison. This was crossed by a stone bridge, guarded by a dragon. The Danish Irek, deterred by the prospect of an encounter with this monster, refused to advance, and even endeavored to persuade his friend to give up the attempt to enter paradise as hopeless, after they had come within sight of the favored land. But the Norseman deliberately walked sword in hand into the maw of the dragon, and the next moment, to his infinite surprise and delight, found himself liberated from the gloom of the monster's interior, and safely placed in paradise. The land was most beautiful, and the grass as gorgeous as purple. It was studded with flowers, and was traversed by honey rills. The land was extensive and level, so that there was not to be seen mountain or hill, and the sun shone cloudless, without night and darkness. The calm of the air was great, and there was but a feeble murmur of wind, and that which there was breathed redolent with the odor of blossoms. After a short walk, Irik observed what certainly must have been a remarkable object namely, a tower or steeple self-suspended in the air, without any support whatever, though access might be had to it by means of a slender ladder. By this, Eric ascended into a loft of the tower, and found there an excellent cold collation prepared for him. After having partaken of this, he went to sleep, and in vision beheld and conversed with his guardian angel, 
who promised to conduct him back to his fatherland, but to come for him again and fetch him away from it forever, at the expiration of the tenth year after his return to Drontheim. Eirik then retraced his steps to India, unmolested by the dragon, which did not affect any surprise at having to disgorge him, and indeed which seems to have been, notwithstanding his looks, but a harmless and passive dragon. After a tedious journey of seven years, Eirik reached his native land, where he related his adventures to the confusion of the heathen, and to the delight and edification of the faithful. And in the tenth year, and at break of day, as Eirik went to prayer, God's spirit caught him away, and he was never seen again in this world. So here ends all we have to say of him. Here we get farther than with Columbus, but however beautiful and credible this story of Eden exploration may have been five hundred years ago, we now know that the only paradise in Ceylon is a symbolical Buddhist one, as far removed from the primitive Garden of Genesis as Roman Catholic Calvarios in South America are from the primitive cavalry of the crucifixion. Moreover, even the scribes of five hundred years ago, however credulous in other things, seem well to have understood the true character of this story of travel, for, according to the majority of the MSS, the story purports to be nothing more than a religious novel. As the Celtic terrestrial paradise, Avalon was a sea-girt island in the waters of the north. It could, of course, be reached only by ship. The first to accomplish this feat, so far as Christian legend informs us, was St. Brandon, son of Finlogo, a celebrated saint of the Irish Church, who died A.D. 576 or 577. According to the story, an angel brought to this good abbot a book from heaven, in which such marvelous things were narrated concerning the then unknown portions of the world, that the honest father charged both angel and book with falsehood, and in his righteous indignation burned the latter. As a punishment for his unbelief, God sentenced him to and recover earth and the book. He must search through hell and earth and sea until he finds the heavenly gift. The token given him by the angel is that when he sees two twin fires flame up, he shall know that they are the two eyes of a certain ox, and on the tongue of that ox he shall find the book. For seven long years he sails the western and the northern ocean. He there encounters more marvels than were recorded in the original incredible book, and is even permitted to visit the earthly paradise. The beauty of the soil, of the fountain with four streams, of the magnificent castle and castle halls lighted with self-luminous stones and adorned with all manner of precious jewels, surpass description. The stay of the party seems, however, to have been short, and unfortunately just where the island was located the commander forgets to mention. A more elaborate and fanciful picture of the same medieval paradise is furnished of us in the story of Ogre, or Holger, a Danish knight of the age of Charlemagne. In a plain prose rendering, this is the style in which a famous court minstrel of six hundred years ago was accustomed to chant the adventure to admiring audiences. So I'm just going to cut in here, just to to reference how they're talking about that it just seems to be a religious, these seem to come from religious books. Well, the common theme there is that every time they look at the religious novels, they come back to those four rivers, and they say that that's the center of the earth, and that they say that that's where we descended from heaven. And we see that every religion that we look into and every time that the people who are telling these stories are people who are closely related to the kings of their their towns or their cities or the places they're from. And it seems like every time that they tell this story, it's it's like a broken telephone that they did have the original story and they tried to maintain as much of it as they could. But through the years, it just became broken down by, you know, broken telephone word of mouth. And so some of the traits are maintained, but a lot of them are lost. And until you look at the actual scripture, which is the Enochian part that we're coming to, um, it doesn't make any sense. What they continue to do is to um, to slough off the information because they say that, well, it must have come from some religious source. And so therefore it has no worthiness. It has no basis in reality. So I just find it interesting that we're still in that situation today where if someone says something and says that it has to do with the origins of man, it's almost like like even if we could prove it, people would never believe it because if we said our proof has anything to do with it, like what if you prove to someone that that is the base of heaven? Just like proving to them that the earth is flat, now you've proven that God exists and that's very difficult for a lot of people to take in.
they don't want to deal with that. I just wanted to be clear there about why, about that, about that everybody sloughs it off because they think that it's religious. And yet, what could be more central is, is who we are and where we came from. So we're back at uh, the story of Oger, or Holger, the Danish knight of Charlemagne. Carahue and Gloriand were in a boat with a fair company, and Oger had with him a thousand men-at-arms. When they were a certain way on, there arose so mighty a tempest that they knew not what to do, only to commit their souls to God. So great was the storm that the mast of Oger's ship broke, and he was constrained to embark in a little vessel with a few of his comrades, and the wind struck them with such fury that they lost sight of Carahue. Carahue was so sore troubled that he was like to die, and he began to mourn the noble Oger, for he wist not what was become of the boat. And Oger in like manner lamented Carahue. Thus grieved Carahue and the Christians in his company, saying, Alas, Oger, what is become of thee? This is, I ween, the most sudden departure that I heard of ever. Nay, but cease, my beloved, said Glorian, he will not fail to come again when God wills, for he cannot be far away. Ah, lady, said Carahue, you know not the dangers of the sea, and I pray God to take him into his keeping. Now I will leave speaking of Carahue and return to Oger, who was in peril, yet was ever grieving for his friend and saying, Ah, Carahue, hope of the remaining days of my life, thou whom I love next to God, how has God allowed me to lose so soon you and your lady? At that moment the great ship in which Oger had left his men-at-arms struck against a rock, and he saw them all perish, at which sight he was like to die of grief. And presently a lodestone rock began to draw towards it the boat in which Oger was. Oger, seeing himself thus taken, recommended his soul to God, saying, My God, my Father and Creator, who has made me in thine image and semblance, have pity on me now and leave me not here to die, for that I have used my power as was best to the increase of the Catholic faith. But if it must be that thou take me, I commit to thy care my brother Gayu and all my relatives and friends especially my nephew Gautier, who is minded to serve thee, and bring the Paynim into thy holy church. Ah, my God, had I known the peril of this adventure, I should never have abandoned the beauty, sense, and honor of Clarice, Queen of England. Had I but gone back to her, I should have seen, too, my redoubted sovereign, Charlemagne, with all the princes who surround him. Meanwhile the boat continued to float upon the water, till it reached the lodestone castle, which they call the Chateau de Avalon which is but a little way from the earthly paradise. Whither were snatched in a beam of fire Elias and Enoch, and where was Morglafe, who at his birth had given him such great gifts. Then the mariners saw well that they were drawing near to the lodestone rock, and they said to Oger, My lord, commend thyself to God, for it is certain that at this moment we are come to our voyage's end. And as they spake, the bark with a swing attached itself to the rock, as though it were cemented there. That night Oger thought over the case in which he was, but he scarce could tell of what sort it might be. And the sailors came and said to Oger, My lord, we are held here without remedy. Wherefore let us look to our stores, for we are here for the remainder of our lives. To which Oger made answer, If this be so, then will I make consideration of our case, for I would assign to each one his share, to the least as to the greatest. For himself Oger kept a double portion for it is the law of the sea that the master of the ship has as much as two others. But if that rule had not been, he would still have needed a double quantity, for he ate as much as two common men. When Oger had apportioned his share to each, he said, Masters, be sparing, I pray you, of your food as much as you may, for so soon as you have no more, be sure that I myself will throw you into the sea. The skipper answered him, My lord, thou wilt escape no better than we. Their food failed them all, one after another, and Oger cast them into the sea, and he remained alone. Then he was so troubled that he knew not what to do. Alas, my God, my Creator, said he, hast thou at this hour forsaken me? I have now no one to comfort me in my misfortune. Thereupon, whether it were his fantasy or no, it seemed to him that a voice replied, God orders that so soon as it be night thou go to a castle after thou hast come to an island which thou wilt presently find. And when thou art on the island, thou wilt find a small path leading to the castle, and whatsoever thing thou seest there, let that not affray thee. And Ogre looked, but wist not who had spoken. Ogre waited the return of night, to learn the truth of that which the voice foretold, and he was so amazed that he wist not what to do, but set himself to the trial. And when night came, he committed himself to God, 
praying him for mercy, and straightway he looked and beheld the castle of Avalon, which shone wondrously. Many nights before he had seen it, but by day it was not visible. Howbeit, so soon as Ogre saw the castle he set about to get there. He saw before him the ships that were fastened to the lodestone rock, and now he walked from ship to ship, and so gained the island. And when there he at once set himself to scale the hill by a path which he found. When he reached the gate of the castle and sought to enter, there came before him two great lions, who stopped him and cast him to the ground. But Ogre sprang up and drew his sword, Curtain, and straightway cleft one of them in twain. Then the other sprang and seized Ogre by the neck, and Ogre turned round and struck off his head. When Ogre had performed this deed, he gave thanks to our lord, and then he entered the hall of the castle, where he found many viands, and a table set as if one should dine there. But no prince nor lord could he see. Now he was so amazed to find no one, save only a horse, which sat at the table as if it had been a human being. This horse, which was called Papillon, or Psyche, waited upon Ogre, gave him to drink from a golden goblet, and at length conducted him to his chamber, and to a bed whose fairy-made coverlet of cloth of gold and ermine was la plus mignon chose qui fait jamais vu, or the nicest he had ever seen. When Ogre awoke he thought to see Papillon again but could see neither, him nor man nor woman, to show him the way from the room. He saw a door, and having made the sign of the cross, sought to pass out that way. But as he tried to do this he encountered a serpent, so hideous that the like has scarce been seen. It would have thrown itself upon Ogre, but that the knight drew his sword and made the creature recoil more than ten feet. But it returned with a bound, for it was very mighty, and the twain fell to fight. And now as Ogre saw that the serpent pressed hard upon him, he struck at it so doughtily with his sword that he severed it in twain. After that, Ogier went along a path which led him to a garden, so beauteous that it was in truth a little paradise. And within were fair trees, bearing fruit of every kind, of tastes diverse and of such sweet odors that he never smelt trees like them before. Ogier, seeing these fruits so fine, desired to eat some, and presently he lighted upon a fine apple tree, whose fruit was like gold, and of these apples he took one and ate. But no sooner had he thus eaten than he became so sick and weak that he had no power nor manhood left. And now again he commended his soul to God and prepared to die. But at this moment, turning round, he was aware of a fair dame, clothed in white, and so richly adorned that she was a glory to behold. Now as Ogre looked upon the lady without moving from his place, he deemed that she was Mary the Virgin, and said, Ava Maria, and saluted her. But she said, Ogre, think not that I am she whom you fancy. I am she who was at your birth, and my name is Morglefe, and I allotted you a gift which was destined to increase your fame eternally through all lands. But now you have left your deeds of war to take with ladies your solace. For as soon as I have taken you from here, I will bring you to Avalon, where you will see the fairest noblesse in the world. And anon she gave him a ring, which had such virtue that Ogre, who was near a hundred years old, returned to the age of thirty. Then said Ogre, Lady, I am more beholden to you than to any other in the world. Blessed be the hour of thy birth, for, without having done aught to deserve at your hands, you have given me countless gifts, and this gift of new life above them all. Ah, lady, that I were before Charlemagne, that he might see the condition in which I now stand, for I feel in me greater strength than I have ever known. Dearest, how can I make return for the honor and great good you have done me? But I swear that I am at your service all the days of my life." Then Morgue took him by the hand and said, My loyal friend, the goal of all my happiness, I will now lead you to my palace in Avalon, where you will see of noblesse the greatest and of damosels the fairest. And she took Odre by the hand and led him to the castle of Avalon, where was King Artus and Alberon and Malambron, who was a sea fairy. As Odre approached the castle, the fairies came to meet him, dancing and singing marvelously sweetly. And he saw many fairy dames, richly crowned and apparelled. And presently came Arthur, and Morgue called to him, and said, Come hither, my lord and brother, and salute the fair flower of chivalry, the honour of the French noblesse, him in whom all generosity and honour and every virtue are lodged, Ogier le Danois, my royal love, my only pleasure, in whom lies for me all hope of happiness. Then Morgue gave Ogier a crown to wear, which was so rich that none here could count its value, and it had beside a wondrous virtue. For every man who bore it on his brow forgot all sorrow and sadness and melancholy, and he thought no more of his country nor of his kin that he had left behind him in the world. 
We leave Ogre thus, bien ici, et entretenu des dames qui s'étaient marvées, and return to the earth, where things were not going so well. For while Ogre was in ferry, the Paynim assembled all their forces, and took Jerusalem, and proceeded to lay siege to Babylon. That is, Cairo at the time. Then the most valiant knights who were left on earth, Moisant and Florian and Carahue and Gautier, Ogre's nephew, assembled all their powers to defend this place. But they lamented greatly because Ogre was no more. And a great battle took place without the walls of Babylon, in which the Saracens, assisted by a renegade, the Admiral Gandice, gained the victory. Ogre had long been in the castle of Avalon, and had begotten a son by Morgue when she, having heard of these doings and of the danger to Christendom, deemed it needful to awake Ogre from his blissful forgetness of all earthly things, and tell him that his presence was needed in this world once more. Thereupon follows an account of Ogre's returning to earth, where no one knew him, and all were astonished at his strange garb and bearing. He inquired for Charlemagne, who had been long since dead. The generation below Ogre had grown to be old men, yet he still had the habit of a man of thirty. We need not wonder that his talk excited suspicion, but at length he made himself known to the king of France, joined his army, and put the pain him to flight. He had now forgotten his life in ferry. He was beloved by the queen of France, the king having been killed, and was about to marry her, when Morgue again appeared and carried him off to Avalon. Looking back over this long story to see just where it locates its paradise and how one could get there, we find the data extremely few and discouraging, and the older story in Plutarch respecting the same Isle of Blessedness is not less destitute of indications as to exact locality. Going some centuries farther back, we find another traveler who claims to have been in terrestrial paradise. He says, As I looked towards the north, over the mountains, I saw seven mountains full of precious balsam and odorous trees and cinnamon and pepper, and from thence I went over the summits of these mountains far towards the east and passed on still farther over the sea, and came far beyond it. And I came into the garden of righteousness, and saw a many-colored crowd of trees of every kind. For many and great trees flourish there, very noble and lovely, and the tree of wisdom, which gives wisdom to anyone who eats of it. It is like the Johannes bread tree, its fruit is like a cluster of grapes, very good, and the fragrance of the tree spreads far around. And I said, Fair is this tree, and how beautiful and ravishing its look. And the holy angel Raphael, who was with me, answered and said to me, This is the tree of wisdom of which thy forefathers, thy hoary first parent and thy aged first mother, ate, and found the knowledge of wisdom, and their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and were driven out of the garden. This favored explorer, who had the special advantage of being guided by a holy angel, was the unknown author of the Book of Enoch which writing is believed by some to be as old as the second century before Christ. No one can read many chapters of his production, however, without arriving at the firm conclusion that sacred geography has little to hope from such a source, however ancient. Coming down to the travelers of our own time, we fare no better, even though they do not tax our credulity with stories of angelic guides or of guardian dragons. One, writing only ten years ago, professedly from the very garden itself, momentarily raises our expectations when he says, Discoveries made within the last decade tend to confirm the supposition that the primeval abode of man was near the confluence of the Euphrates and the Tigris, and that it is not too much to anticipate the exhuming of inscribed tablets, which will fully establish this belief. But as suddenly as our hopes are excited, so suddenly do they die away in disappointment. Incredulous critics greet the suggestion of exhuming inscribed tablets on the subject with a chorus of derisive laughter. The author himself does not venture to give any of the discoveries made within the last decade which tend to confirm the notion that Eden was located at the point described. On the contrary, in the immediately following sentence, he takes leave of the subject and so doing gives us over to his own admitted uncertainty in the following terms. And although, after the lapse of so many centuries, exact correspondence of topography is not to be expected, yet guided by the general features of the scene rather than by the minuter ones, the present traditional Garden of Eden may be accepted until another has been discovered, and its identity more clearly proved. In such darkness dies out the kindled hope. Meantime, in a letter to Sir Roderick Murchison, published in the Athenaeum, not far from the same date, the indefatigable Livingstone disclosed the secret of his tireless perambulations through Central Africa. 
He believed that at the sources of the Nile, could he once discover them, he would stand upon the site of the primeval paradise. Evidently, exploration, wonderful as have been its achievements, has not yet solved the problem of the site of Eden. To this day, the word of Pindar, uttered half a thousand years before Christ, has remained true. Quote, neither by taking ship, neither by any travel on foot, to the Hyperborean field shalt thou find the wondrous way. Chapter 2. The Results of Theologians Some have placed it in the third heaven, some in the fourth, and in the heaven of the moon, in the moon itself, on a mountain near the lunar heaven, in the middle region of the air, out of the earth, upon the earth, beneath the earth, in a place that is hidden and separated from man. It has been placed under the northern pole, in Tartari, or in the place now occupied by the Caspian Sea. Others placed it in the extreme south, in the land of fire, others in the Levant, or on the shores of the Ganges, or in the island of Ceylon. It has been placed in China, or in an accessible region, beyond the Black Sea, by others in America, in Africa, etc. All this from Bishop Hewitt. For me it's very clear that it was at the North Pole, and then we had the flood, and the peoples that had been there were dislocated to the to the other regions that after the flood that they were the boat landed on um, Mount Ararat or somewhere near that location in fact I think it's on Ararat but the ark landed there and the people descended there and that's why you have civilization springing from that area being the Middle East but that originally the four and that that's when they they found two rivers there and called them naming them after what they called them when they were in paradise or close to paradise at Mount Meru so they they renamed those rivers for rivers that they knew before the flood but they were naming rivers that were thousands of miles away from where they were because during the flood when Noah got on the ark and that they were they drifted to a much farther place theologians so back to the text now that was me talking and thinking out loud about what I think about it Theologians, Christian and Jewish, have in all ages differed, and irreconcilably differed, as to the location of the cradle of the human race. The evidences of this are so well known, or so easily accessible to every intelligent reader, that they need not be adduced in this place. The fathers and theologians of the early church and of the Middle Ages held many curious and conflicting opinions upon the subject. Some, following the allegorizing method of Philo, interpreted the whole narrative in Genesis as a parable setting forth spiritual things. Eden was not a place, but a state of spiritual blessedness. The four rivers were not rivers, but the four cardinal virtues, etc. The majority, however, held to the historic character of the narrative, and to the strictly geographical reality of Eden. To the question of its location, numberless were the answers. Often it was in the Far East, beyond all lands inhabited by men. Sometimes it was thought of as perhaps within or under the earth, in the regions of the dead. Sometimes it was neither on nor below the earth, but high above it, in the third heaven, or some way associated with the lunar orbit. Again it would be stated that there are two paradises, a celestial and a terrestrial one, the one in heaven, the other on the earth. Tertullian, conceiving of the torrid zone as the flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life from Genesis 3.24, placed Eden beyond it in the southern hemisphere. Now it was at the bottom of the sea, or again it held a position midway between earth and heaven. Anon, it was on the summit of a miraculous mountain, which rose to the height of the moon. Of this mountain only the base was washed, when by the waters of the deluge all other mountains were covered. It was conceived of as rising in three gigantic stages to its stupendous height. All kinds of marvelous plants and precious metals and gems adorned it, but its supreme adornment was a divine river, which starting from the throne of God in the highest heaven, descended to the holy garden on the mountain's head, and thence parting into four, after watering and beautifying the whole mountain in its descent, gradually lost more and more of its celestial taste and vivifying virtues, and became the water system of the habitable globe. Sometimes the location of this mountain was described as in some distant portion of the earth, where the sea or earth and the sky meet, Impatient of such contradictions, Luther, in his own brusque way, rejected all attempts to locate the primeval garden, declaring that the deluge had so changed the face of the earth in the course of its original rivers that all search was fruitless. 
Calvin, on the contrary, confidently affirmed that the writer of the Genesis narrative must be understood as locating the Garden of Eden near the mouths of the Euphrates. Soon this original diversity of Protestant teaching upon the subject became aggravated by new theories, some of them suggested by orthodox ingenuity, some introduced by rationalistic conceptions of the semi-mythical character of the Bible, until at the present time the state of theological teaching respecting Eden is, if possible, a worse Babel than in any preceding age. For a partial illustration of the confusion, one has only to turn to the most recent and authoritative biblical, theological, and religious encyclopedias. In McClintock and Strong's The Writer on Eden inclines to locate it in Armenia. In Smith's Bible Dictionary, the problem is abandoned as probably insoluble. In the great German encyclopedia, Herzog, it is declared necessary to deny the, to the story of Eden a strictly historical character. It is a bit of mythical geography. In the supplement, however, Pressel makes an elaborate argument of many pages in favor of the location at the junction of the Tigris and Euphrates. Dilliman, in Schenkel's Bible Lexicon, places it in the Himalayas north of India. In the chief Roman Catholic cyclopedia, Wetzel, and Welt's Kirchen Lexicon, the writer vacillates between Eastern Asia, taken in a vague and undefined sense, and an equally undefined north. In Lichtenberg's just completed Encyclopedia of Religious Sciences, the whole story in Genesis 2 is declared as a philosophic myth. Professor Brown of New York, in the new work edited by Dr. Schaff, on the basis of Herzog, enumerates a variety of opinions advocated by others, but refrains from expressing any opinion of his own. Such is all the light which contemporary theology seems able to throw upon our problem. But here some plain reader of the Bible opens at the second chapter of Genesis and reads, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And the plain reader asks how a believer in the Bible can doubt this passage fixes the location of the garden somewhere to the east of Palestine. But looking a little more critically, our inquirer himself quickly sees that the verse does not necessarily affirm anything as to the direction of the garden from the writer. It may naturally mean that the garden was planted in the eastern part of the land of Eden, wherever that was. And turning to the most careful and orthodox commentators, he finds that not a few take this view of it. Moreover, Mikidim, here translated eastward, may be otherwise translated, as it is in the King James Version, in the passages of Psalms uh, 44 and 44.12 and 56.6 and elsewhere. In fact, in the Vulgate, it is here translated a principio, in or from the beginning. Among the early Greek translators, Samachus, Theodosian, and Aquila understood the term in the same way. Hence, nearly 200 years ago, the learned Thomas Burnett wrote as follows. Some have thought that the word Mikidim, Genesis 2, was to be rendered in the east or eastward as we read it, and therefore determined the site of paradise. But tis only the Septuagint that translates it so. All the other Greek versions in St. Jerome, the Vulgate, the Chaldee, paraphrase, and the Syriac render it from the beginning or in the beginning, or to that effect. And we that do not believe the Septuagint to have been infallible or inspired have no reason to prefer their single authority above all the rest. The same writer says again, we may safely say that none of the Christian fathers, Latin or Greek, ever placed paradise in Mesopotamia. That is a conceit and innovation of some modern authors, which hath been much encouraged of late because it gave more ease and rest as to further inquiries and an argument they could not well manage. But the four rivers, says our inquirer, and he reads verses 10 through 14. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, and the name of the second river is Gihon, and the name of the third river is Hydekel, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Surely here in the fourth river we have one undeniable landmark. However impossible it may be to satisfactorily identify all four of the primitive rivers of Eden, the mention of the Euphrates, at least, restricts the location of the garden to some part of the region drained by that river. Consulting the theologians, however, our investigator finds a great variety of serious objections urged against this short and easy method of settling the controversy. First, he is told that some biblical critics have expressed doubt as to the genuineness of the verses, and that as earnest a defender of the Bible as Mr. Granville Penn considered the whole passage an interpolation. Secondly, he learns that parath, or frat, the Hebrew name of the river is from the older form burati or puratu, a word believed to signify the broad or the deep. Of course, such a descriptive term may well have been the name of more than one ancient river, just as broad brook is the name of many an American stream. 
Indeed, in his learned work, Le Berceau de l'Espace Humaine, O'Brien shows that in ancient times Frat or Euphrates was the name of one or possibly two of the rivers of Persia. One of these in Pliny's time still bore the name in the hardly changed form Ophratus. Lenormont says he does not hesitate to consider the Frath of the Corda Avesta identical with the Persian river Helmand. Africa also had its sacred Euphrates. If, therefore, the passage in Genesis is genuine, and Moses wrote of the Frath, it is not certain what broad or abounding river he had in mind. Moreover, in any case, the Euphrates of Mesopotamia is not one of four equal offshoots into which one river proceeding out of Eden divides itself according to the statements of the text. So its source is not from another river at all, but from ordinary mountain springs. Thirdly, it must not be forgotten, our friend is told, that all peoples coming into a new country love to name their new rivers and towns after the loved and sacred ones they left in the older home. The Thames of New England perpetuates the memory of the Thames of Old England. It is very seldom indeed, says a late writer, that a river has no namesakes. Very possibly, therefore, the Frath of Mesopotamia may have been named for some elder river of the antediluvian world, wherever that may have been. That it was so is the firm belief of various learned writers. Fourthly, continue the theologians, the language of Ezekiel 13.9 and of Proverbs 3.18 11, 30, etc., shows that poetic and symbolical applications of the name and images of Eden were common. And if the Hebrews named one of the water courses at Jerusalem Gihon in commemoration of one of the four paradise rivers, it is not irrational to suppose that the inhabitants of Mesopotamia may have called their chief stream in honor of another of the four. Lenormont, Grill, O'Brien, and others support this view. They might have rendered the probability still stronger by calling attention to the fact that the oldest name of Babylon, tin tir -ki, was of the same commemorative or symbolical character, and signified the place of the tree of life. Finally, pursuing these curious investigations further, our plain reader finds mention in Pausanias 2.5 of a strange belief of the ancients, according to which the Euphrates, after disappearing in a marsh and flowing a long distance underground, rises again beyond Ethiopia and flows through Egypt as the Nile. This reminds him of the language of Josephus, according to which the Ganges, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Nile are all but parts of one river which ran round about the whole earth. The Oceanos rivers of the Greeks, or the Okeanos river of the Greeks. And he wonders whether the old Shemitic term from which the modern Euphrates is derived was not originally a name of the general water system of the world a name of that ocean river which Aristotle describes as rising in the upper heavens, descending in rain upon the earth, feeding, as Homer tells us, all fountains and rivers and every sea, flowing through all these watercourses down into the great and broad equatorial ocean current which girdles the world in its embrace. Thence branching out from the further shore into the rivers of the underworld, to be at last fire purged and sublimated, and returned in purity to the upper heavens to recommence its round. And just as he is wondering over the question, he finds that some of the Assyriologists, in their investigation of pre-Babylonian Akkadian mythology, have found reason to believe this surmise correct, and to say that in that mythology the term Euphrates was applied to the rope of the world, the encircling river of the snake god of the tree of life, the heavenly river which surrounds the earth. Furthermore, as he turns back to the pages of Hyginus and, and Manilius and Lucius Ampelius and reads of the fall of the world egg at the beginning into the river Euphrates, he perceives that he is in a mythologic and not a historic region. And when he lights upon a mutilated fragment of an ancient Assyrian inscription, in which descriptions of the visible and invisible world are mixed up together, and in which the river of the life of the world is designated by the name Euphrates, he quickly concludes that it will not do to take the term Frath, or Euphrata, as always and everywhere, referring to the historic river of Mesopotamia. Hitherto, then, the results of the theologians as to the location of Eden are purely negative and mutually destructive. It would be difficult, says one of their number, to find any subject in the whole history of opinion which has so invited and at the same time so completely baffled conjecture as this. Theory after theory has been advanced but none has been found which satisfies the required conditions. The site of Eden will ever rank with the quadrature of the circle and the interpretation of unfulfilled prophecy among those unsolved and perhaps insoluble problems 
which possess so strange a fascination. Chapter 3. The Results of Non-Theological Scholars, Naturalists, Ethnologists, etc. A quote from Charles Darwin. It is useless to speculate on this subject. Charles Darwin. And we know how useful a quote from Charles Darwin has turned out to be. The location of the cradle of the human race is as much a problem for the ethnologist and anthropologist as it is for the theologian, the archaeologist, the zoologist, and even the biologist, if at all broad and philosophical in their inquiries, cannot ignore the high interest of the questions. Was there for the human race one primitive center of distribution? And if so, where was it located? Thirty years ago, the pretentious American work by Knott and Glidden, entitled The Types of Mankind, a work written in opposition to the doctrine of the unity of the human race, attracted unusual attention to the former of these questions. The teaching therein put forth was that there are very many types of varieties of men without genealogical connection with each other, and that therefore a great number of primitive centers of distribution must be assumed. The avowed prejudices of the projectors of the work against certain races, particularly the African, would have rendered the influence of the work upon the scientific world extremely slight, had not contributions of some value from Dr. S. G. Morton and Professor Louis Agassiz been incorporated with it. As it was, it gave European ethnologists occasion to form and express very uncomplimentary conceptions of American representatives of ethnological research. Fortunately, these crude beginners of the science have had no influential successors of their own sort in this country, and but obscure or half-hearted disciples in any other. The polygeny of the race has at present no respectable support. Even the author of the latest and perhaps ablest of the works on the pre-Adamite hypothesis remarked, The plural origin of mankind is a doctrine now almost entirely superseded. All schools admit the probable descent of all races from a common stock. To the second question, therefore, the attention of the scientific and archaeological world is steadily gravitating. Given one primeval point of departure for the race, where shall that point of departure be sought? The answers which recent biologists, naturalists, and ethnologists have given to this problem are hardly less numerous or less conflicting than are the solutions proposed by theologians. Of these answers, Professor Zeckler, in a late work, enumerates ten, each having the support of eminent scientific names. In latitude they range from Greenland to Central Africa, and in longitude from America to Central Asia. Of the whole number, the two which seem to command the widest and weightiest support are, first, the hypothesis that Lemuria, a wholly imaginary, now submerged prehistoric continent under the northern portion of the Indian Ocean was the mother region of the race, and secondly, that it was in the heart of Central Asia. The former of these sites is the one supported by Heichel, Kaspari, Peschel, and many others. Though less positive, Darwin and Lyell seem favorable to the same location or to one in the adjoining portion of Africa. Most of the recent maps of the progressive dispersion of the race over the globe have been constructed in accordance with this theory. Perhaps the best popular summary of the arguments in its favor is that found in Oscar Peschel's Races of Men. But while biological speculation, especially in the hands of Darwinists, is strongly inclined toward the chief habitat of the ape tribes in its attempts to find man's primitive point of departure, comparative philologists, mythologists, and archaeological ethnographers have of late very strongly tended to place the cradle of mankind on the lofty plateau of Pamir in Central Asia. For these, the eminent French anthropologist, Cotrafège, is well entitled to speak. We know, says this savant, that in Asia there is a vast region bounded on the south and southwest by the Himalayas, on the west by the Bolor Mountains, on the northwest by the Alatau, and on the north by the Altai Range and its offshoots, on the east by the King Khan, on the south and southeast by the Felina and Quenlun. Judging of it by what exists at the present day, this great central region might be regarded as having included the cradle of the human race. In fact, the three fundamental types of all the races of mankind are represented in the populations grouped around this region. The Negro races are the furthest removed from it, but have nevertheless marine stations, in which they are found pure or mixed, from the Kyushu to the Andaman Islands. On the continent, they have mingled their blood with nearly all the inferior castes and classes of the two Gangetic peninsulas. They are still found pure in each of them. They ascend as far as Nepal, and according to Elphinstone, spread to the west as far as the Persian Gulf and Lake Zare. The yellow race, pure or mixed, here and there with white elements, seems alone to occupy the area in question. The circumference of this region is peopled by it to the north, the east, the southeast, and the west. In the south it is more mixed, but, but it nonetheless forms an important element of the population. By its allophilian representative seems to have disputed the possession of even the central area itself with the yellow race. 
In early times, we find the Yu Qi, the Wu Sons, to the north of Huang Ho, and at the present day in Little Tibet, in Eastern Tibet, small islands of white populations have been pointed out. The Miao Tse occupy the mountainous regions of China. The Sayapus are proof against all attacks in the gorges of Bolor. On the confines of this area, we find to the east the Ainos and the Japanese of high caste, the Tinguians of the Philippine Islands, to the south the Hindus. To the southwest and west, the white element, pure or mixed, is completely predominant. No other region on the face of the globe ah, no other region presents similar reunion of the extreme types of the human race distributed around a common center. This fact of itself might suggest to the naturalist the conjecture which I have expressed above, but we may appeal to other considerations. One of the weightiest of these is drawn from philology. The three fundamental forms of human language are found in the same region and in analogous connections. In the center, in the southeast of our area, the monosyllabic languages are represented by the Chinese, the Annamite, the Siamese, and the Tibetan. As agglutinative languages, we find from the northeast to the northwest, the group of the Ugro Japanese, in the south that of the Dravidians and the Malays, and in the west the Turkish languages. Lastly, Sanskrit with its derivatives and the Iranian languages represent, in the south and southwest, the inflectional languages. With the linguistic types accumulated around the central region of Asia, all human languages are connected, either by their vocabulary or their grammar. Some of these Asiatic languages resemble very closely languages spoken in regions far removed or separated from the area in question by very different languages. Lastly, it is from Asia again that our earliest tame domestic animals have come. Isidore Geoffrey St. Hilaire is entirely agreed on this point with Duro de la Malle. Thus, taking into account only the present epoch, everything leads us back to the central plateau, or rather this vast enclosure. Here we are inclined to say to ourselves, the first human beings appeared, and multiplied down to the moment when the populations overflowed like a bowl which is too full, and poured themselves out in human waves in all directions. This view of the location of the first center of the race is very widely accepted. It has the support of many great names. To its establishment, Contributions have been made by scholars in a great variety of fields. Among them may be mentioned Laysen, Bernouf, Ewald, Renan, O'Brien, de Eckstein, Hoffer, Senart, Maspero, Lenormont, etc. Perhaps the most important single treatise representing the view is O'Brien's Cradle of the Human Species, a work of singular interest to every scholar. But the latest writers on the question are by no means confined to the two locations just mentioned. The difficulty of accounting for the first advent of human beings in America, without supposing in early times a closer land connection between the eastern and western hemispheres and the intertropical regions that now exists, has led not a few ethnologists to postulate a lost Atlantis, including perhaps the Canary and Madeira Islands or the Azores, or located to the north or south of them, and to place it in the fountainhead of the streams of population which colonized both the Old and the New World. Another location lately advanced with great confidence and supported with remarkable acuteness and learning is that advocated by Dr. Friedrich Delich in his valuable work entitled Wolog das Paradis. This site is on the Euphrates between Baghdad and Babylon, and the author's construction the four rivers are the great canal west of the Euphrates called by the Greeks the Palakopas, the Shat and Nil, and the lower Tigris and Euphrates. But despite the conceited ability of the plea, there seems at present little prospect that it will secure acceptance among scholars. The distinguished Theodore Noldke, in a recent review, while cordially praising the learning and ingenuity of the work, professes himself unmoved by its arguments. Similarly, a critic in this country writes, Unfortunately for the theory so powerfully advanced, almost all the linguistic evidences by which it is supported are still of doubtful value. The etymology of the Babylonian names in most cases, and the reading in some, being disputed by high authorities in this obscure field of inquiry. Were the linguistic points proved, it would be hard to resist the power of the argument, in spite of various difficulties arising from the scanty text of Genesis itself. As it is, although all other solutions of the naughty biblical problem may be subject to still graver objections, the following questions militate too strongly against Professor Dilich's solution. Why, if the stream of Eden be the middle Euphrates, is it left unnamed in the narrative? though it is certain that the Hebrews were perfectly familiar both with the middle and the upper course of that river. Why, if the Pison and Gihon designate the canals Palacopas and Shat Anil, are they said to compass the lands which the canals only traverse? If the lower Tigris be meant by the Heidekel, 
Why is this river described as flowing in front of Assyria, which lay above the central Mesopotamian lowland asserted to be Eden? How should a writer familiar with the whole course of the Tigris deem its lower part a branch of the Euphrates? Why should Cush, a name which commonly designated Ethiopia, have been used by the narrator in a sense in which it nowhere else occurs in the scriptures, without the least further definition? Why, on the other hand, is Havilah, if the Arabian borderland so well known to the Hebrews to be meant, so fully described by its products? Who tells us that the gold, the delium, and the shoham of Babylonia were also characteristic of the adjoining Havilah? But whether these objections in the present stage of Assyriological studies be fatal to the theory of Professor Delich or not, we have no hesitation in saying that his dissertation, amplified as it is by the supplementary treatises on the ancient geography and ethnology of the Mesopotamian and neighboring countries of Canaan, Egypt, and Elam, is a perfect treasury of knowledge, made most accessible by excellent indexes, and probably the most brilliant production in all biblico assyriological literature. At the present writing, the latest monograph upon the subject is the one just published in the Revue de l'Histoire des Religions, from the pen of M. Beauvoir. This locates the Eden of ethnic traditions in America, and ascribes to the Celtic race no small influence upon the Greco-Roman mythology in the development of such ideas as those pertaining to the gardens of the Hesperides, the Isles of the Blessed, etc. The site advocated is not new, though the line of argument is fresh and scholarly. The hypothesis that the cradle of the race is to be sought in America has before found advocacy at the hands of J. Klaproth, Gobineau, and others. That this, however, is not to be the last and only word on the subject is evident from the fact that, in a huge work just from the press, an English writer says, If there be an earthly original for the heavenly Eden, it will be found in equatorial Africa, the land of seething, swarming, multitudinous, and colossal life. This was the world of wet and heaven of heat, the land of equal day and dark, that supplied the two truths of Warti, Egyptian, the top of the world, the very nipple, the kapa, of the breast of earth which is there one vast streaming fount of moisture quick with life. So surely as a topographical meru is found in Habesh, so surely is the earthly paradise the original of the mythical which was carried forth over the world by the migrations from Cam to be found there, if at all. In fine, so resultless seem all discussions and investigations in this field that in his work on the Patriarchs of Humanity, Dr. Julius Grill, like Noldke, prefers to locate lost paradise in utopia, and to deny it all historic reality. Evidently, the naturalists and the ethnologists, the comparative mythologists, and Kulturgeschichtschreiber have not yet solved the problem. Their mother region of the human race is as elusive and protean as are any of the terrestrial Edens of theology, or of legend, or of poetry. Thus far, then, all search has been fruitless. Paradise is indeed lost. The explorer cannot find it. The theologian, the naturalist, and the archaeologist have all sought it in vain. Representative voices out of every camp are heard confessing utter ignorance as to the region where human history began. The problem, says Professor Ebers, remains unanswered. End chapter 3. Chapter 4. Part 2nd. A New Hypothesis. The Hypothesis and Its Admissibility, Its Effect Upon the Problem, and Its Solution. When Newton said, Hypotheses non fingo, he did not mean that he deprived himself of the facilities of investigation afforded by assuming in the first instance what he hoped ultimately to be able to prove. Without such assumptions, science could never have attained its present state. John Stuart Mill In scientific investigations, it is permitted to invent any hypothesis, and if it explains various large and independent classes of facts, it rises to the rank of a well-grounded theory. Charles Darwin Chapter 1. The Hypothesis. The golden guess is morning stall to the full round of truth. Tennyson. From the foregoing chapters it would seem as if nearly every imaginable site for the Gan Eden of Genesis had been proposed, examined, and found unavailable. One, however, remains. A region of rarest interest in astronomical, physical, and historical geography. The natural center of the only historic hemisphere. Considering the fascination of the subject, and the inexhaustible ingenuity that has been expended upon it, it seems remarkable that it should be left to the closing years of the 19th century to bring forward and seriously to test the proposition that the cradle of the human race, the Eden of primitive tradition, was situated at the North Pole, in a country submerged at the time of the deluge. 
This is the hypothesis which it is proposed in the following pages to examine, and according to the evidences to a judge. We propose to make the test both strict and comprehensive. Hypothesis, however promising, must be brought face to face with reality. Ours, like its numberless predecessors, must be rejected if the solid facts of any of the following sciences show that it is inadmissible. General geogony, or the science of the origin of the earth, is point one. Point two. Mathematical, or astronomical geography, particularly its teaching as to the inhabitableness or uninhabitableness of the circumpolar region with respect to light. Yeah. Point three. Physiographical geology particularly its teachings as to the probability or improbability of the former existence and subsequent submersion of a circumpolar country. Point four, prehistoric climatology, particularly with reference to the temperature at the pole at the time of the beginning of human history. Point five, paleontological botany. Point six, paleontological zoology. Point seven, paleontological anthropology and ethnology. And point eight, comparative mythology viewed as the science of the oldest traditionary beliefs and memories of mankind. On the contrary, if the hypothesis is capable of meeting this eightfold test, and especially if we can show, not only that it is admissible, but also that in greater or less degree it is supported by the positive evidence of the facts in nearly all of these fields of knowledge, we shall afford a much more complete and convincing verification than is at all usual in matters of prehistoric research. Footnotes 47.1 as to the alleged newness of the above hypothesis, it is proper to say that something like a year elapsed after its full acceptance and public announcement by the writer before he could find any evidence that it had ever been entertained or advocated by any other person. He then met with the allusion in the passage quoted from Bishop Hewitt as a motto to chapter 2nd of the preceding part, and with a similar allusion in an anonymous article in Dickens All the Year Round. Whether these were more than rhetorical flourishes, he was long in doubt. Not until after the manuscript of the present work had been completed, packed, and addressed to the publishers was the doubt resolved by finding in an anonymous English magazine article of more than thirty years ago this brief statement. Pastelius, or Pastellus, will have it that paradise was under the North Pole. Who Pastellus was and what he wrote upon the subject remain to be investigated. Suffice to say that up to the date of this writing the author has found no book or tractate in which the above hypothesis has ever been advocated. This fact renders some of the mottos prefixed to the chapters farther on remarkably significant and impressive. In many cases their authors express truths which they themselves did not perceive. Chapter 2. Important new features at once introduced into the problem of the site of Eden. Significance of these for a valid solution. A quote from John Stuart Mill. Quote, it appears then to be a condition of a genuinely scientific hypothesis that it be not destined always to remain an hypothesis but be certain to be either proved or disproved by that comparison with, obs with observed facts which is termed verification. Verification is proof. If the supposition accords with the phenomena there needs no other evidence of it. John Stuart Mill It is evident on a moment's thought that our hypothesis immediately and materially modifies the whole problem of the location of paradise. Given a prehistoric circumpolar continent at the North Pole, as the cradle of the race, what must have been marked and memorable features of that primitive abode? 1. To the first men there would have been but one day and one night in a year. 2. The stars, instead of seeming to rise and set, would have had an apparently horizontal motion round and round the observer from left to right. The pole, the unmoving center point of the heavens, directly overhead, would naturally have seemed to be the top of the world, the true heaven, the changeless seat of the supreme, all-ruling God. And if, accordingly, through all the long lifetime of the antediluvian world, the circumpolar sky was to human thought the true abode of God, the oldest post-diluvian peoples, though scattered down the sides of the globe half or two-thirds the distance to the equator, could not easily have forgotten that at the center and true top of the rotating sky was the throne of its great creator and that there, in the far north, was the sacred quarter of the world. Standing at the pole of the earth, an observer would be not only directly under the center of the celestial hemisphere, but also directly on the center of the surface of the terrestrial hemisphere. There and there alone the heavenly bodies would move in horizontal planes round and round him everywhere, at an apparently equal distance, and he would seem to himself to stand on the one precise center point of the entire earth. Every departure of a few miles in any direction from this polar position would at once confirm this first impression. 
If, therefore, primeval Eden was at the pole, the descendants of the first man, going away from such an original country, could hardly have failed to remember it as the center of all lands, the omphalos of the whole earth. Supposing the first man to have been located in the central and most elevated portion of the hypothetical Eden land, the streams there originating and flowing seaward would have flowed not in one but in various opposite directions toward all the cardinal points of the horizon. Moreover, all of these streams being obviously fed not by each other, but by the rain from heaven, it would not have required a very powerful imagination to conceive of them as parts of a finer and more celestial stream, whose head springs were in the sky. If finally the streams flowing in the opposite directions grew at length into four opposite flowing rivers, Flumina Principalia, as many old theologians have called them, dividing the circumpolar land into four nearly equal quarters, it would have constituted a never-to-be-forgotten feature of that first home of men. In another chapter we shall expose the baselessness of the popular impression that at the pole six months of every twelve are spent in darkness, and shall show that, on the contrary, less than one-fifth of the year is so spent, while more than four-fifths are spent in light. This being true, a primitive abode in that part of the world would have been remembered by the descendants of the first man as preeminently a land of beauty, preeminently the home of the sun. Moreover, Arctic explorers find it impossible to describe the nocturnal splendors of the aurora borealis in those regions, the whole top of the globe off time ceiling veiled in and over canopied with quivering curtains and banners and streamers of living, leaping flame. It is therefore easy to believe that, once exiled from such a home, mankind would ever have looked back to it as an abode of unearthly and preternatural effulgence, a home fit for the occupancy of gods and holy immortals. Finally, point seven, assuming the prevalence of an equable tropical temperature, we find the biological conditions of the region, such as the extraordinary prevalence of daylight, the intenser terrestrial magnetism, and the unparalleled electric forces which feed the northern lights, all combining to raise a high probability that if ever such a land as we have supposed existed, it must have presented forms of life surpassing those with which we are familiar, a flora and fauna of almost unimagined vigor and luxuriance of development. Under such conditions, men themselves may well have had a stature and strength and longevity never attained since the deluge, which destroyed the world that then was, and immediately or ultimately occasioned the translocation of the seed of our new post-Diluvian humanity into the cold and barren and desolate regions of the northern temperate zone. And if the first men were of the stature and strength and longevity supposed, how certainly would traditions of the fact linger in the memory of mankind long after its exile from its earlier and happier home? Glancing back now over these various points, one instantly sees that they present conditions of human existence totally unlike the conditions of life as we know it, or as it has ever been known in what are called historic ages. They necessarily modify in the profoundest manner the whole problem of the site of Eden. No solution ever heretofore presented exposed itself to refutation at so many points. None ever before postulated so extraordinary an adjustment of both heavens and earth. None ever before required in order to its establishment, so incredibly wide a concurrency of testimony. Against no other has it ever been possible for the very stars in their courses to fight. If false, it demands of human tradition shadowy recollections of world conditions which have never existed in human experience. An hypothesis so peculiarly difficult must surely break down, if it be not true. Promising the reader, therefore, not a new ignas fatus chase, but at least the satisfaction of a definite result as respects one hypothesis, we cordially invite his critical and patient attention to the facts to be presented in the following chapters. Part 3rd. The Hypothesis Scientifically Tested and Confirmed. Chapter 1. The Testimony of Scientific Geogony. Chapter 2. The Testimony of Astronomical Geography. Chapter 3. The Testimony of Physiographical Geography. Chapter 4. The Testimony of Prehistoric Climatology. Chapter 5. The Testimony of Paleontological Botany. Chapter 6. The Testimony of Paleontological Zoology. Chapter 7. The Testimony of Paleontological Anthropology and Ethnology. Chapter 8. The Conclusion of this Part. Quote, it follows that man, issuing from a mother region still undetermined, but which a number of considerations indicate to have been in the north, has radiated in several directions, that his migrations have been constantly from north to south. M. Le Marquis de Saporta. In Popular Science, 1883, page 753. Eine Jeder Reis der Ehemaligen 
and Vashant Height. Okay. Every journey undertaken after the ice gated island world in the north of America knows of signs of the former presence of a people inhabiting lands which today seems to be no longer a human foot. Dr. F. Boas in the Journal of the Society for Geography in Berlin. Volume 18, 1883, page 118. Could it once be proven that the Arctic terminus of the Earth has always been the ice-bound region which it now is, and which for thousands of years it has been, it would of course be useless to entertain for a moment the hypothesis that the cradle of the human race was there located. Probably the popular impression that from the beginning of the world the far north has been the region of unendurable cold has been one of the chief reasons why our hypothesis is so late in claiming attention. At the present time, however, so far as this difficulty is concerned, Scientific studies have abundantly prepared the way for the new theory. That the Earth is a slowly cooling body is a doctrine now, all but universally accepted. Okay. The problem is that he still thinks of the Earth as a ball. In saying this, we say nothing for or against the so-called nebular hypothesis of the origin of the world. For both friends and foes of this unproven hypothesis believe in what is termed the secular cooling or refrigeration of the earth. All authorities in this field hold and teach that the time was when the slowly solidifying planet was too hot to support any form of life, and that only at some particular time in the cooling process was there a temperature reached which was adapted to the necessities of living things. On what portion of the Earth's surface now would this temperature first be reached, or would it everywhere be reached at the same time? These are most interesting questions, and the writer has often marveled that in scientific treatises on the cooling globe... Yeah, we're going to skip. This is about solar heating and cooling. We know from some of the other stuff that we've looked at that um, once you get past a certain point going northward, it does become warm. And the reason that I think that is, as mentioned in other texts, is that there's actually warm air blowing down from the heavens above. So I'm going to skip this part entirely because that's all that it is that talks about the cooling of the earth mass. And it has absolutely no bearing. So we're going to skip that chapter. The Testimony of Astronomical Geography. The nights are never so dark at the pole as in other regions, for the moon and stars seem to possess twice as much light and effulgence. In addition, there is a continuous light in the north, the varied shades and play of which are amongst the strangest phenomena of nature. From Rambossen's Astronomy The fact which gives the phenomena of the polar aurora its greatest importance is that the earth becomes self-luminous, that, besides the light, which as a plane it receives from the central body, it shows a capability of sustaining a luminous process proper to itself. From Humboldt We are apt to think of an unbroken night of six months at the pole. Eminent scientific authorities speak as if this conception were correct. Thus, Professor Geike, in his admirable new manual of geology, writing of the Arctic flora of the Miocene age, says, When we remember that this vegetation grew luxuriantly within eight degrees and fifteen minutes, of the North Pole, in a region which is in darkness for half of the year, we can realize the difficulty of the problem in the distribution of climate which these facts present to the geologist. In like manner, Sir Charles Lyell, discussing the question of the possibility of whales reaching the supposed open sea at the Pole, says, they could pass under considerable barriers of ice, provided there were openings here and there, and so they may, perhaps, reach a more open sea near the Pole and find sustenance there during a day of more than five months' duration. From such representations as these, the reader naturally carries away the impression that daylight lasts at the pole somewhat over five months, while all the rest of the year the region is shrouded in darkness. Were this true, it would certainly be an unpromising region in which to search for the terrestrial paradise. Fortunately for our hypothesis, this conception of the duration of the polar night is very far from true. The half-yearly reign of darkness exists only in the uninstructed imagination. Astronomical geography teaches that, as respects daylight, the polar regions are and always have been the most favored portions of the globe. As early a popularizer of natural science as the Reverend Thomas Dick set forth the real facts as follows, Quote, Under the poles, where the darkness of night would continue six months without intermission if there were no refraction, 
Total darkness does not prevail one half of this period. When the sun sets at the North Pole, about the 23rd of September, the inhabitants, if any, enjoy a perpetual aurora till he has descended 18 degrees below the horizon. In his course through the ecliptic, the sun is two months before he can reach this point, during which time there is a perpetual twilight. In two months more, he arrives again at the same point, namely 18 degrees below the horizon, when a new twilight commences, which is continually increasing in brilliancy for other two months, at the end of which the body of this luminary is seen rising in all its glory, so that in this region the light of day is enjoyed in a greater or less degree for ten months, without interruption by the effects of atmospheric refraction. And during the two months when the influence of the solar light is entirely withdrawn, the moon is shining above the horizon for two half months without intermission. And thus it happens that no more than two separate fortnights are passed in total darkness. And this darkness is alleviated by the light of the stars and the frequent coruscations of the aurora borealis. Hence it appears that there are no portions of our globe which enjoy throughout the year so large a portion of the solar light as these northern regions. Striking as is this account of the polar day, it is noteworthy that experience has repeatedly shown that the actual duration of light in high latitudes exceeds even the calculations of the astronomers. Thus, in the spring of 1893, the officers of the Austrian expedition, under Lieutenants Weiprecht and Payer, were surprised to behold the sun three days before the date on which he was expected to rise. A late writer thus states the case, in the latitude of 79 degrees 50 minutes north, in which the Tegatov was lying, the sun ought to reappear above the horizon on the 19th of February, but, owing to an effect of refraction, due to the low temperature prevailing, minus 30 degrees, the explorers were able to salute its rays three days earlier. Lieutenant Payer's own account is as follows. Though the sun did not return to our latitude, 78 degrees 15 minutes north, 71 degrees 38 minutes east, or longitude, till the 19th of February. We were able to greet his beams three days previous to that date, owing to the strong refraction of one degree in 40 minutes, which accompanied a temperature of minus 30 degrees. Still more remarkable was the experience of Barents's Arctic expedition almost 300 years ago. Dr. Dick alludes to it as follows. The refractive power of the atmosphere has been found to be much greater, in certain cases, than what has now been stated. In the year 1595, 1596 and 7, a company of Dutch sailors having been wrecked on the shores of Novaya Zemlya, and having been obliged to remain in that desolate region during a night of more than three months, it was a little less than three months, beheld the sun make his appearance in the horizon about sixteen days before the time in which he should have risen according to calculation, and when his body was actually more than four degrees below the horizon. The only explanation of this astonishing phenomenon which the same writer offers is found in this appended clause which circumstance has been attributed to the great refractive power of the atmosphere in those intensely cold regions. This is so unsatisfactory that not a few prefer to believe what seems entirely incredible, namely that Barents and his men in the short space of less than three months made a blunder of sixteen days in their time record. Not likely. Professor Nordenskjold has recently referred to the case as follows. On the 14th, 4th November, the sun disappeared and was again visible on the 3rd Feb through the 24th Jan. These dates have caused scientific men much perplexity, because in latitude 76 degrees north, the upper edge of the sun ought to have ceased to be visible when the sun's south declination in autumn became greater than 13 degrees, and to have become visible again when the declination again became less than that figure. That is to say, the sun ought to have been seen for the last time at Barents's Ice Haven on the 7th and 11th October and it ought to have appeared again there on the 14th through the 4th of Feb. It has been supposed that the deviation arose from a considerable error in counting the days, but this was unanimously denied by the crew who wintered. In a footnote he gives proofs which seem convincing that no such error can have been committed. But while these experiences of Barents and the Austrians point to a duration of darkness at the pole of less than 60 days out of the 365, some apparently good authorities extend the period to 76 or 77 days. Thus Captain Bedford Pym of the Royal Navy of Great Britain makes the following statement. On the 16th of March the sun rises, preceded by a long dawn of 47 days, namely from the 29th of January, when the first glimmer of light appears. On the 25th of September the sun sets, and after a twilight of 48 days, namely on the 13th November, 
darkness reigned supreme, so far as the sun is concerned, for seventy-six days, followed by one long period of light, the sun remaining above the horizon one hundred and ninety-four days. The year, therefore, is thus divided at the pole, one hundred ninety-four days sun, seventy-six days darkness, forty-seven days dawn, forty-eight twilight. Even according to this account, we should have at the pole only 76 days of darkness to 289 days of light in the year. In other words, instead of being in darkness little short of half of the time, as at the equator, one would be in darkness but about one-fourth of the time. As far as light is concerned, therefore, even on this calculation the polar region is twice as favorable to life as any equatorial region that can be named. But whence this discrepancy amongst the astronomers? Why should some of them make the polar night 16 days longer than others? The simple answer is that they proceed upon different assumptions as to atmospheric refraction in the region of the pole. In our latitude, twilight is usually reckoned to begin when the center of the rising sun is yet 18 degrees below the horizon. Starting with this as the limit, and counting sunrise and sunset to be the moments when the sun's upper limb is on the horizon, we arrive at the division of the polar year given by Captain Pym. But astronomers say that in England twilight has been observed when the sun was 21 degrees below the horizon. To be entirely safe, some have therefore taken 20 degrees as the limit of solar depression, and reckoning with this datum, instead of the 18 degrees before mentioned, have found that at the pole the morning twilight would begin January 20th, and the evening twilight would cease November 21st. This would make the period of darkness but 60 days, and the period of light 305. Thus a difference of only two degrees in the assumed limit of solar depression at the beginning and end of the twilights makes the difference of 16 days in the supposed duration of darkness, which of the two calculations, writes an eminent American mathematician, is the more correct is known, I imagine, by no one. To us in the present discussion the discrepancy is of very little moment. It is only a question as to whether the pole there is daylight three-fourths or five-sixths of the year. Both suppositions may be and probably are wrong. For if in tropical climates 16 or 17 degrees is said to be a sufficient allowance for the extreme solar depression, while on the other hand it is said in England to vary from 17 to 21 degrees, it certainly looks as though in yet higher latitudes the light of the sun might be discernible when its body is as much as 21 or 22 degrees below the horizon. And this would reduce the annual polar darkness to less than 50 days. This supposition is rendered the more probable by the fact that while the expeditions already alluded to have found much more of daylight than their astronomical calculations had led them to expect, we have no offsetting accounts where the sun was weighted in vain. The final and authoritative settlement of the question can be reached only by actual observation. Among the fascinating problem whose solution awaits the progress of Arctic exploration, we must therefore place the scientific determination of the unknown duration of the polar day. In view of the foregoing, we are certainly safe in conceiving of the polar night as lasting not over four fortnights. During two of these, as Dick reminds us, the moon would be walking in beauty through the heavens and exhibiting all her changing phases of loveliness in unbroken successions. The other two would be passed beneath the starry arc of heaven, all of whose sparkling constellations would be moving round and round the observer in exactly horizontal orbits. In such a perfect and regular stellar system kept in view so long and so continuously, the irregular movements of the planets or wandering stars could not possibly escape observation. All their curious accelerations, retardations, conjunctions, declinations would be perfectly marked and measured on the revolving but chainless dial plate of the remoter sky. Dwelling in such a natural observatory, any people would of necessity become astronomers, and how magnificent and orderly would the ongoings of the universe appear when viewed from underneath a firmament whose center of revolution was fixed in the observer's zenith. After long months of unbroken daylight, how would one soul yearn for a new vision of those stellar glories of the night? Nor would the moon and silent stars be the only attractions of the brief period during which the light of the sun was withdrawn. The mystic play of the northern light would transform the familiar daylight world into a veritable fairyland. In our latitude, the aurora borealis is a comparatively rare and tame phenomenon. In the highest arctic regions, it almost nightly kindles its unearthly glories. In itself, it is lightning diluted and sublimated to the point of harmlessness. Sometimes these electric discharges not only fill the whole heaven with palpitating draperies, but also tip the hills with lambent flame, and cause the very soil on which one stands to prickle with a kind of life. 
but after all the glories of the night begin the greater glories of the polar day. Who with any approach to adequacy has ever described a dawn? What poet has not attempted it, and what poet has not failed? But if it be impossible to picture one of our brief and evanescent day-dawns, who shall attempt a description of that surpassing spectacle in which all the splendors and loveliness of sixty of our dawns are combined in one? No words can ever portray it. No poet's imagination, even, has ever given us such unearthly scenery. First of all appears, low in the horizon of the night sky, a scarcely visible flush of light. At first it only makes a few stars' light seem a trifle fainter, but after a little it is seen to be increasing, and to be moving laterally along the yet dark horizon. Twenty-four hours later it has made a complete circuit around the observer, and is causing a larger number of stars to pale. Soon the widening light glows with the luster of orient pearl. Onward it moves in its stately rounds, until the pearly whiteness buds into ruddy rose light, fringed with purple and gold. Day after day, as we measure days, the splendid panorama circles on, and according as atmospheric conditions and clouds present more or less favorable conditions of reflection, kindles and fades, kindles and fades, fades only to kindle next time yet more brightly, as the still hidden sun comes nearer and nearer his point of emergence. At length, when for two long months such prophetic displays have been filling the whole heavens with these increscent and revolving splendors, the sun begins to emerge from his long retirement, and to display himself once more to human vision. After one or two circuits, during which his dazzling upper limb grows to a full orb disk, he clears all hilltops of the distant horizon, and for six full months circles around and around the world's great axis in full view, suffering no night to fall upon his favorite homeland at the pole. Even when at last he sinks again from view, he covers his retreat with a repetition of the deepening and fading splendors which filled his long dawning. As if in these pulses of more and more distant light he were signaling back to the forsaken world the promises and prophecies of an early return. In these prosaic sentences we aim at no description of the indescribable. We only remind ourselves of the bald facts and conditions which govern the unpicturable transformations of each year-long polar night and day. Enough, however, has been said for our purpose. Whoever seeks as a probable location for paradise the heavenliest spot on earth with respect to light and darkness, and with respect to celestial scenery, must be content to seek it at the Arctic Pole. Here is the true city of the sun. Here is the one and only spot on earth respecting which it would seem as if the Creator had said, as of his own heavenly residence, there shall be no night there. Chapter 3. The Testimony of Physiographical Geology Arctic Geology Contains the Keys to the Solution of Many Riddles That's from Professor Heer. That's translated from German. Another quote from Baron Nordenskjöld. An extensive continent occupied this portion of the globe when these strata were deposited. Baron Nordenskjöld. Our hypothesis calls for an antediluvian continent at the Arctic Pole. It is interesting to find that a writer upon the deluge writing more than 40 years ago advanced the same postulate. Is the supposition that there existed such a continent scientifically unadmissible? So I'm going to pause here. Chapter 3. The Testimony of Physiographical Geology.
Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.